Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to both the local and the remote audiences. Uh, we're live streaming to the Howard Baker Center at UT, Georgia Tech, the University of Virginia, uh, some Battelle Regional offices, and, and also webcasting. So, so hopefully we've got some folks watching from, from around the region and, and who knows, even around the world. Uh, and, and anyone viewing the lecture uh, online can submit questions at the end uh, via Facebook and Twitter. Oak Ridge Lab News, all one word, um, is, the, is the Twitter handle to use. Um, we kicked off this, this series in November uh, with the first Eugene P. Wigner uh, Distinguished Lecture in Science, Technology, and Policy. Uh, that was that was co timed to coincide uh, with the first startup of the graphite reactor in 1943, kind of marking the 70th anniversary uh, of the lab. Uh, if you regard turning on the graphite reactor as a birthday, which I think is a good way to to think about it, but this is this is an ongoing effort, and so that's why we're here uh, today for the second uh, Wigner lecture. The series is organized by the corporate fellows to invigorate scientific discovery, spur technological innovation, and initiate productive scientific policy debate. Uh, and of course, the, the name honors Eugene Wigner, who, who you might say is a bit of a patron saint of ORNL. He trained as a chemical engineer um, and uh, had very broad interests. Uh, there is, he trained as a chemical engineer in, in Hungary uh, I think partly stimulated by the fact that his, his parents, his father in particular, want, wanted him to do something useful. He came from a family that had been in the tanning business, and that seemed like a, a useful sort of thing to do. Uh, but along the way, he discovered a great love of physics uh, and, and moved to Berlin, where uh, he, although he had no formal training, he basically got to participate in the birth of quantum mechanics through the kind of symposiums and lectures that were given by all the people who came through. And uh, in fact, uh, he, he did a lot of important work in fundamental symmetries and fundamental symmetries in atomic theory and, and eventually that same uh, kind of conceptual framework became very important for nuclear physics and, and what became high energy physics. And for that work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1963. Um, he was also a founder of the field of nuclear engineering and one of the holders of the patent for the light water reactor, um, along with Alvin Weinberg and others. Uh, so in, in a very real sense, he's a great role model for the coupling of basic and applied work. Uh, and he put that into practice in his role as research director of ORNL, or Clinton Laboratories, as it was called at the time, between 1946 and 47, where he led an effort to define uh, the blueprint uh, in terms of the research portfolio uh, for this new entity that was coming into being, in fact, um, this new concept of a national lab. Um, so that's a little bit of a background on, on Wigner. Our lecture today is Arun Majumdar. Uh, his ba educational background started with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. He then went on to a PhD in mechanical engineering at the University of California, Berkeley in 1989. Um, he's had a distinguished career, career in science and engineering. He was a faculty member at Arizona State University and UC Santa Barbara before joining UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in 1997. Uh, his research interests include science and engineering of nanoscale materials and devices, also large engineered systems. He held several administrative positions at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, director of the Berkeley Nanosciences and Nanoengineering Institute, the director of the Environmental Energy Technologies Division, and the ALD for Energy and Environment. He then went on to uh, service at the Department of Energy, uh, he was the founding director of ARPA-E and held that position from October 2009 to 2012. So he really had the, uh, the unusual uh, privilege of, of starting up an entirely new, uh, not only new program, but a new program model uh, within DOE. Um, and then went on to serve as acting undersecretary of energy and senior advisor to energy secretary Steve Chu uh, between March of 2011 and uh, 2012. He's published hundreds of papers, holds many patents, 
His recognitions include a member of the National Academy of Engineering, fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, now he is serving as the Vice President for Energy at Google. It's actually harder, it's hard to imagine a more radical transition than federal service in DOE to Google, uh, although I guess you could argue that ARPA-E was intended to be the Google of DOE, so maybe it's not that big a transition. Uh, in, the, in the role at Google, he's driving Google's energy technologies and investments. He's advising the company on its broad energy strategy. This is no small task. Google has one of the world's largest corporate data center infrastructures and has invested over a billion dollars in renewable energy product, projects. Uh, his lecture today is titled Energy and the Industrial Revolution, Past, Present, and Future. Please join me in welcoming Arun Majumdar. Tom, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, and Tom and Ramesh, thanks for inviting me and honoring me with this lecture. Um, I realized the previous speaker was a Nobel laureate, um, Albert Furt, and the next speaker, uh, Stephen Chu, is also a Nobel laureate. So I really applaud your efforts in trying to get me a Nobel Prize uh, <laughs> and keep the continuity. And please go ahead, keep going. It's a hard task, but I, I applaud your efforts. Um, so the title of the talk is Energy and the Industrial Revolution. What I'll do is I'll try to give a, first a little historic view of what we are working on energy today and where we have really come from, and perhaps look at the future and some of the challenges and opportunities that lies in front of us. Um, the first thing I'd like you to do is to just step back um, and imagine yourself when the United States was being created. 1776 is the, is the year, but a little bit in a plus minus 10 or 15 years, both sides. And imagine what, what life was like. And the only thing we remember are some of the stories and some of the pictures. So let me see if I can move this. Uh, and the pictures are what we you know, are used to, George Washington on a horse, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and at that time, what life was like is the following. Mobility was by horses and walking. And that lamp out there is what was used for lighting, and the fuel in that is whale oil. And so if, if you imagine life at that time, they had no idea what life would be like in the 20th century and now in the 21st century. They, they, if someone said that you're going to be using the Internet or you're going to have the electricity grid, that was unthinkable at that time, but that's in, that is indeed what happened. So that was, life was what life was like at that time. And if you look at what happened over the last 250 years, um, it, is, it is a transformation that is um, unlike anything that happened in the history of humanity, is what we call horsepower to horsepower. Today, you travel to the grocery store or drop your kids off at school with 300 horses taking you in an engine, um, in, an, in a device that is of the size of, you know, is, uh, of this desk out here, the podium, um, and smaller. And that's 300 horses fitted in there. I traveled across from San Francisco to here uh, and with 100,000 horses taking me there, uh, taking me, uh, bringing me here, and in a time frame of a few hours that would have otherwise taken months. So that's what, in a, if you imagine, in the history of humanity, this is, this is pretty spectacular. And now we have the electricity grid, which has been phenomenal. It, in fact, it's called, the, the National Academy of Engineering called it the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. And everything we do is, it goes around the electricity grid. Even the information infrastructure, even Google, uh, cannot survive without electricity. So that's what life has become now. Now, if you, if you look at where this has come from, uh, what has happened, uh, this is what has happened over the last 250 years. 
the global per capita GDP, if it's, uh, it's considered a metric for prosperity, um, it has increased exponentially. And so has our energy use. And so the Industrial Revolution is all about energy. It's all about how we source energy, how we use energy, how we distribute energy. It's all about energy. And as you can see, most of the energy has been sourced from fossil sources. There's another exponential increase that has happened over the last 250 years, and that is the world population. And the world population went from 700 million people at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to, to 7 billion today. And over the next 50 years, we're going to have another 2 billion, and by the end of the century, it's predicted to be 10 billion people. So another 3 billion people will be added in about you know, 90 years or so, uh, in precisely the same regions that don't have electricity today, that don't have access to energy that we have today. So that's the world of the future. The question is, if, if, that's the, if you want the, to continue this exponential growth in our economy, in our prosperity, do we have all the energy that we need? So do we have enough fossil fuels to, to support the population economic growth? If the last 250 years is about fossil energy and, and using that, do we have enough of that for the next 100 years? And the answer is absolutely yes. On the left-hand side is the global oil reserves, and the right-hand side is the global gas reserves without counting U.S. shale. And as you can see, there is no peak oil. And why is that? People talk about peak oil. The reason we don't have any peak is because the technology for discovery and extraction keeps improving and becoming cheaper to the point that it's keeping pace with the demand and sometimes going ahead of the demand. And so that's why we don't have any peaks, and in fact, this will keep on improving. And we will find, we'll keep finding a lot more affordable oil. Yes, the oil prices in the future may be going up, but the abundance of that is the question, and I think we have plenty. The use of fossil fuel, as we know it, has other consequences. If you are to go live in this world, or if our children and grandchildren are going to grow up in this world of fossil-based uh, energy, we have to be aware of a few consequences. The top one is the fluctuation in oil price and economic unpredictability. And as you can see, as, as you well know, the price of oil is not decided by the President of the United States, as a lot of people in media sometimes claim it is. It is not decided by Congress. It is a global market. And the fluctuations that you see, almost all of them for the last 40 years or so, has been because of global events, not U.S. events. And if you are to live in this world, we have to live with this unpredictability. No matter how much oil we produce locally, the price is determined by a global market. Uh, the other part is, okay, if we are importing oil, and those imports are going down because of local production of shale oil and unconventional oil, and that is true. But it's still on the order of $300 billion a year that we're sending out, and we'd rather use that for our local, local economic growth, but that's not what's happening. So this is a world we, have to, we, have, we, we should be aware of and we have to live with, and we are not alone. This is China. Uh, the domestic consumption is way ahead of domestic production, and they will be going for this resource as well, and so will India, and so will Brazil. Brazil is actually has its own resources, but that's the world we'll be living in, and everyone is in this bind. They all want to produce their own energy. The question is, uh, can we do it? The other consequence of this is, as we all know, that if we burn fossil fuel, we will have global warming. That's just the laws of physics. We will we will be raising the temperature, and as a consequence of that, there will be climate change, which is something that we don't completely understand how it happens. Now, when we talk about climate change um, and we talk about global warming, we all know that the temperature of the Earth has gone up by 0.8 degrees since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And... You know, if you ask, if you go on the streets out here in Knoxville or in San Francisco and ask a layperson, you know, 0.8 degrees, most people will say, okay, how does it matter? Because my home fluctuates by 10 degrees every day, and 10 degrees, you know, changes, temperature changes around in the environment all the time. So what is 0.8 degrees? 
And I think that misses the point. And what I'll, I'm going to show you is not the average, but the distribution. And the distribution is about um, the, uh, from the, the average of sometimes hot, sometimes cold. And what I'd like you to sh- see is the, is the movie of the, how the distribution is moving over time. And this is of summer temperatures only, not the winter, of summer temperatures in the northern hemisphere of the land. So this is the theore- theoretical. As you can see, the right-hand side is red, is hot. And this is the data. It's normalized with standard deviations, so one sigma, two sigma, 70s, 80s, and now you'll see the 90s. Okay? So if, if I go back now, um, let me show that to you again. So what you can see is there is a clear direction for this distribution. The average is certainly moving. It's moving to the right-hand side, and it could be 0.8 degrees or so. But that's just a very small part of the story. The tails of the distribution are reaching four to five sigma at probabilities that were unheard of 20, 30 years ago. And if you look at the geograph, this is average globally. If you look at the geographical distribution, and this is happening as heat waves. In 2012, we had a massive heat wave in the Midwest out here. And a few years ago, it was in Moscow where tens of thousands of people got affected. People died. Before that, it was somewhere in France and Europe. People died again. And it affects not only people dying, but it affects our agriculture, the livestock, and a lot of significant part of our economy. So this is the other part of the world that we have to worry about. So if you are to live in this world, you could ask the question, okay, if it's about carbon emission, let's do some math, some simple numbers. If it's about the Industrial Revolution, let's ask the question, what is the cumulative amount of CO2 that we have emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? Because when we emit CO2, it goes in the atmosphere and hangs around for about 100 years or so, and then some of it gets absorbed in the ocean. But the lifetime of CO2 molecules is 100 to 200 years or so. So how much CO2 have we emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which is only 250 years old? And the approximate number, the order of magnitude, is about a trillion tons. A trillion tons. And that has happened over 250 years. Then he asked the question, based on the known reserves of fossil fuel today, okay, so if you take all those fossil fuel that we know, and that, by the way, those reserves keep increasing because the technology improves, as I mentioned earlier, but if you take today's f- known reserves of fossil fuel and just burn it off, how much more CO2 can we emit in the atmosphere? Okay, so that's the second question. How much more CO2 can we emit based on known fossil fuel reserves today? And the number is about 3 trillion tons. So three times more. And then he asked the question, how long will this take based on our, our business as usual scenario of our economic growth and our fossil fuel use? How long will it take? And the number is 75 to 100 years. So three times more CO2 at one-third the time is almost a 10x factor right there. And then you ask the question, these three trillion tons of CO2, that carbon in the form of fossil fuel, how much is it worth? Okay, what is the worth? And the number is tens of trillions of dollars. So this is the, this is the option that is posed in front of society. Should we use this $10 trillion for economic growth, exponential economic growth, and to help with the environment? Or should we keep those $10 trillion down in the ground and save the environment, and not use it for economic growth and save the environment? And that, my friends, is a false choice because it does not take into account the fact that we can create, we can innovate, we can do research and find better solutions than what we have today. And this is articulated very well by a former oil minister of Saudi Arabia. The Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones, because we transitioned to better solution, and that's where, that's where research and innovation and science and engineering really comes in. And to articulate that, um, Steve Chu and I wrote a paper um, at the end of my tenure in, in DOE, which appeared in Nature, 
which we really call for the industrial, the new industrial revolution. If the former, the last industrial revolution is about uh, use of energy, fossil fuels, to, for the exponential growth in our prosperity, etc., what is the new industrial revolution? And for this, we need research and innovation. So this is what ARPA-E and the research establishment in DOE is really for. And so if you look at what ARPA-E is about, I'll tell you the gist of what this is about. In energy, cost and scale is everything. If something does not go down in cost and become competitive without subsidies, and if it does not scale in volume, it doesn't matter. So you can put that in terms of learning curves, whether it is time on the x-axis or scale. On the vertical axis is cost over some performance. And any technology, whether it is the horse carriage or something else, is on a learning curve because if you do, if you do more and more of it, uh, you can improve incrementally and become better and better. So the horse carriage is an example of that. But the horse carriage is now obsolete because at some point early um, in the 20th century or late 19th century, people were trying out new things. Uh, and there were several attempts of motorizing this. And, you know, some of them failed, whether it's a steam engine car or some other car. There was a gas turbine car at some point. And they all failed because it was not quite economic and they needed scale. And finally, the Model T happened and, and, and made the, the horse carriage obsolete. So the goal of RPE is to not go incrementally down an existing learning curve, but to create entirely new learning curves at the early stages, which in where you need a portfolio of approaches, without knowing which one's going to win and which one's going to lose, and let the market pick that, but to try out and different approaches that will eventually beat the existing learning curve in the future. That's the whole idea. And so this has been done, done and so the idea is to do that for, the, for U.S. economic and environmental security, as well as to ensure U.S. lead in advanced energy technologies. That was the whole purpose of RPE, to create entirely new learning curves, whereas the other parts of DOE, some, some of the applied programs, is to do research to go down existing learning curves. And that's important also. That's the insurance policy. So I'm going to give you a few examples of what we saw in RPE as some of the breakthrough technologies or early stages of those technologies without knowing whether it's actually going to succeed, but with the chance that one of them actually might. So when we're talking about energy, we have to talk about energy systems. And there are two systems that we have in the United States, and in, in fact across the world. One is the stationary system, which is where electricity to your homes or natural gas to your homes and industry is all about. The other is the transportation system, which is predominantly because of gasoline and diesel and used in our light duty and heavy duty vehicles. These two systems are essentially independent of each other, except for the use of electricity in our transportation today, which is a very, very small fraction. But other than that, they are essentially independent of each other. So I'm going to start talking first about the station system and see what are those possible better solutions that you could have in the future. Of course, today, I mean, it, it, it goes without saying that without talking about shale, it's very hard to imagine what energy would be like. And this is a, in, in many sense, uh, it, this is a disruptive technology, which was in the early 80s and early 90s were thought to be a, a crazy idea. But right now it has been affordable. So what is in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing all about? Well, you go down about a mile or more down, and then you reach the shale formation, which is, there's a lot of hydrocarbons trapped in there, extremely impermeable. Then you go horizontally in that shale formation, apply pressure, crack it, increase the permeability. And that's how you know, shale gas and oil is recovered. Now, <clears throat> there's, I'm going to highlight some of the materials issues that are involved in this, which are important to note because there's an opportunity to really contribute. So if you look at the shale gas extraction process, it is a coupling between chemistry, transport, and mechanics. Let me explain that. On the graph that you see, on the vertical axis is the flow rate. And the horizontal axis is the year. So, as you can see, when you, when you have a well, 
uh, you start producing and it peaks. And then it's sort of tail. There's a long tail associated with it. And over the years, this peak has improved, has, in, has gone up, and we have improved our technology to produce it in an affordable way. But we have absolutely no idea how this tail is shaped and how long this tail is going to last. That's the state of the art. So there's a, you know, people talk about the abundance of shale gas. That is true. But there's an error bar associated with it, but no one seems to be talking about it. And we really don't know how this tail is shaped, and because we really don't understand the details of the science and the engineering that's going on inside. Let me give you an example. This is an electron micrograph of a shale rock. The pores are 10 to 100 nanometers in size. These are, these are pores, are, there's a coating of something called kerogen, which are long-chain hydrocarbons. The natural gas, the methane and the propane and others, long-chain, small you know, chains of hydrocarbons, they're adsorbed, they follow Langmuir isotherms, adsorbed on the surface of that. And if you heat it or if you, you, know, if you, if you, um, you, know, if you reduce the pressure, they will dissolve, and that's what you get. The 10 to 100 nanometers is actually smaller than the mean free path of molecules in atmospheric pressure. So the transport that happens does not always flow, have follow viscous flow. It follows Knudsen flow. And people really don't understand the coupling between the mechanics of the pores, which is elastic, and the fluid dynamics of it. It's a coupled fluid mechanics and solid mechanics problem. And the models, the simulation models that are used today to predict do not have that, have that coupling today. So that's the state of the art in the industry. And most of the people in the geophysics and geology area who I talk to say that we sort of ignored shale because we had to just drill through to get to the sandstone. And right now, the people are trying to learn, understand the mechanics, the chemistry, the physics of all, all these kinds of formation. So there's a lot of opportunity to really help out. And not all shales are the same. There's a shale in Alabama, for example, which there's a lot of hydrocarbons, but it cannot be fracked because it has a high clay content. And clay, as you know, is a two-dimensional material. If you try to pressurize it, it slips. It goes through viscoplastic behavior. So it cannot fracture it. So if someone can, this was a challenge I proposed at the MRS meeting, is that if you can, the mechanics people out here can figure out how to fracture viscoplastic clay-based shale, you can extract those hydrocarbons as well. But we cannot do that today. So natural gas has had a pretty important effect on our energy scene because number one, in fact, the predominant one, is on our electricity system. So I'm going to present out here the levelized cost of electricity generation, and I put a bar out there at five cents a kilowatt hour because that is the lowest cost of electricity production today, um, and that is due to natural gas. Because of the low cost of natural gas as a feedstock and the abundance that we have, as well as the high efficiency of these combined cycle turbines, the cost of producing electricity is about four to five cents a kilowatt hour. And that has become the benchmark. This is unsubsidized cost. The question is, okay, if that's the benchmark, where are the rest of the uh, uh, electricity generation sources? Well, this is, um, you know, on the renewable side, you have solar, which is anywhere from 10 to 15, sometimes 18 cents a kilowatt hour, depending whether it's utility or, or residential. Wind can be cheaper than coal, for example, as you can see, depending on the size of the windmill and the location and the quality of the wind out there, can be cheaper. Now, um, in DOE, we created something called the Sunshot Initiative, which Ramesh uh, really led that whole effort. And the idea, the Sunshot, just like President um, Kennedy had moonshot to go to the moon and return safely within the decade. The sunshot was not to go to the sun uh, and return safely, but to reduce the cost of electricity uh, to five cents a kilowatt hour within this decade. And I think there's a very good chance with all the efforts that Ramesh and his team had that we will actually get to that within this decade. But if not within this decade, give it plus minus you know, two years and we'll get there. And so if that's the case, if that becomes wind and solar becomes the cheapest way to produce electricity, we have an issue. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Because as opposed to the other sources like coal or nuclear, um, or for that matter, geothermal, these are distributed and these are modular. And the whole paradigm of the grid 
that we have, the architecture of the grid that goes back to Tesla and Edison, uh, is based on the paradigm that you have centralized generation because it was cheaper. And then you have long-distance transmission, and then you have a whole dispatch process that we have in electricity is based on that centralized generation. But suddenly, now you have cheaper ways to produce electricity that are distributed and modular and intermittent. What do we do? We really don't have good ideas to, to really integrate and have these penetrate at 70 80% penetration. We really don't know how to do that. Now, this is happening. This is the, the cost cents per kilowatt hour of, for wind, and the green line out there is the deployment of, um, of wind power, and this is on the order of you know, 60 gigawatts or so. And you have to realize the capacity for the United States, the electrical capacity, is a terawatt. So while it is exponential growth, it's still a small number. But if it continues like that, the penetration could be much higher. In California, the penetration renewable is 18%. And we have a problem in California. I can talk, talk about that as well. But in, if you look at wind, there are materials issues. Um, and primarily, the major problem that all these wind turbine companies are facing are in magnets. You see, most of the permanent magnets are based on iron boride-based magnets with a little bit of neodymium and dysprosium. And neodymium and rare earths like that, most of them come from China, 95%. And the demand internally in China is going up as well. So they're reluctant to let go some of that. So there's a supply chain risk that is going on. And so in ARPA-E, we, tried, we created a program to see if you can come up with the same performance, in fact, better performance in, in hard magnets, but without the use of rare earth or very minimal use of rare earth. So this is one example of many. And this is a, a crystal of iron-16 nitrogen-2, which is highly anisotropic. In fact, it has an energy density which is higher than neodymium-based iron boride magnets. But, and it has been shown, and it was explored in the 70s, but people forgot about it. And, and now we're reviving that. It has been shown in thin films, but to go from thin films to bulk material is not trivial in these magnets because all the dipoles have to be aligned. It has to be manufactured the right way. So this is a project. It's going on in Minnesota. It's going on in Oak Ridge. And it's going on at Case Western in trying to make this in magnets. Because if this happens, you know, this is going to be a major, major breakthrough for all the wind manufacturers, not just wind the generators, but also the motors as well. In solar, this is the cost reduction that has happened in the module, the PV module cost. Today, it's less than a dollar per watt on the module. In fact, about 60 cents a watt. And the deployment of solar has, is going up exponentially as well. Not only the utility scale, but also in the residential scale. This is the panel cost. You've got to realize that the fully installed cost is not just the panel cost. In fact, there's a big chunk of it. The majority of the cost today is not on the panel, but on the balance of systems. And the, you have the data, the numbers out there, and the question that we are asking is, how do you reduce the balance of system cost? And there are multiple knobs on this, and there are, there are a few technological knobs. One of them is the efficiency, and the other is the, um, is the weight of these, um, of these panels. In terms of efficiency, if you ask the question, where are we? As you know, for single junction cells, there's a theoretical limit called the Shockley quasar limit. Crystalline silicon production level is on the order of 20 to 25 percent. If you go to sun power, that's about the average uh, efficiency. And for multi-crystalline silicon, SIGs and cadmium tellurides, anywhere from 14 to 15, 13 percent or so. That's the production level. And in, as part of the sunshot, um, Ramesh and his team created something called the Michael Jordan Initiative. And that is to increase the, the efficiency of cadmium telluride to 23 percent which is where the reference to Michael Jordan comes in. Because if that happens, this is a game changer. Even if you get to a production level of 20% efficiency, this is a game changer because the balance system cost comes down. And not to, not, not to say that's the only set of technologies, here is uh, something from Alta Devices on 3-5 based um, cells, 28.8% efficiency in the lab. They're trying to get production at 25% or 25%. 
And if they can do that, and they're having some problems in the production side of it, but if they can do that, this is also be a game changer, and this is on flexible light substrates. So there's a lot of innovation that still needs to happen in this area, to not so much to reduce the panel cost, but to reduce the balance of system cost in these materials. Storage, of course, is a big deal, because with, without storage, it is extremely hard to integrate these renewable resources, which are intermittent, at high levels of penetration. The average penetration of renewables, like wind in the United States, is about 3.5% today. If we try to get to 15 or 18 or 20% renewable in our grid today, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult. And as I said, in California, it's 18%. And in the next year or so, we're going to have some major problems because a nuclear plant in Southern California has gone out of action. And so this is going to be a very significant issue, whether we can manage demand or, or, or control the supply in the right way. But with storage, this could, be, this could be handled. But the storage cost is too high. On the left, on this graph out here, is the first cost, the capital expenditure, not the levelized cost. And you have you know, $10, $100, and $1,000 a kilowatt hour. And the lowest, the cheapest way to store electricity today, as many of you know, is pumped hydro. It's $100 or less per kilowatt hour of capital expenditure, so that the levelized cost of storage becomes two to two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And that's the additional levelized cost to the electricity generation. Now, if you look at all the other technologies for storage, because hydro cannot be done in many parts of the world, those, were, those are still in the $500 to $1,000 a kilowatt hour. So in RPV, we created a program to go for those disruptive solutions that could essentially reduce the cost of electrochemical. In fact, we said we don't care about the technology. Figure it out, whether it's flywheels, electrochemical, or superconducting magnetic energy storage. We don't care as long as you can potentially hit $100 a kilowatt hour in the future. Are there new ideas? And there's several. These are a combination of flow batteries and many others. Here's an example coming out of City College, zinc manganese oxide. It's not even a flow battery. It's a completely sealed battery, and they're shooting for $100 a kilowatt hour. They're, today, the prototype cost is about $300 a kilowatt hour. Uh, there are many others. 24M came out of MIT, Yetmin Chang's group, where they took the best of the chemistry of lithium ion put that in a flow architecture to create a lithium-ion flow battery with conducting fluids as your flow is a fluid material. And they created 24M, 24M being the molarity of lithium in these intercalated materials. Uh, Primus is looking at zinc bromide-based batteries. Fluidic energy zinc air rechargeable batteries came out of Arizona State. So there's a whole competition that's happening. Many of these companies are prototyping and piloting these overseas to look at the performance, and they're monitoring them. So this is coming, and the cost of batteries is going to come down for stationary storage as well. Um, the grid, as I said, is something of a big challenge in the United States. As I mentioned, this, the architecture for the grid and the paradigm for centralized generation, long-distance transmission at high voltage, medium voltage distribution at feeder lines in your homes, et cetera, and low voltage, you know, that architecture, that paradigm goes back to Tesla and Edison. And not much has changed. The devices may have changed, but the architecture is still the same. We lose about $100 billion a year in power outages, and the ones due to weather uh, is about 20 to $30 billion, and the White House just came out with a report using EIA data and the ones due to weather keep on increasing. The trend is going, it's going up. Um, and Super Storm, Storm Sandy is sort of the first instance or, or the big visible thing that we saw. The question that we have to ask is that, is this the best architecture? Could we do something different? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, of what the challenges are. People talk about uh, cybersecurity. I'm going to call it cyber physical security. And this is a very real issue. And I'll give you one example of this that happened close to home. Um, this happened in the morning, very early morning on April 16th. Most people don't know. We did not know either. This is in San Jose. So if you go from San Jose to Morgan Hill on 101 South, um, there's in between you, on the right-hand side, you'll see a big substation where all the transmission line comes and there's a distribution feeder that goes out from there. It's called the PG&E Metcalf 600-kilovolt substation. And on April 16th, 
at 2 a.m. in the morning, people with guns, a group of people with guns, came in there and shot at the radiators of the transformers to go down the step-down transformers at the, exactly the right place in the radiators that would leak 50,000 gallons of cooling oil. Out of the 14 transformer, 10 were hit. And it leaked out all this oil. oil. And as bad as that, that may sound, 15 minutes before that, they went into the level three vaults of the cables for telephone and fiber optic, and they sheared that off as well, so that 911 was disabled. And we live in this area. I live in this area. None of us heard about it because it happened on April 16th at 2 a.m., and that was less than 24 hours after the Boston Marathon bombing where the media was focused on Boston. And we still don't know who did that. And whether it was a trial run or not, whether it was something else, this is the state of our... So when I call it security, it's not just the cyber security, but the cyber physical security, because some of these substations can be taken out. It could be very bad for a grid. So this is a, a, you know, we have to think about it in a very, very strategic way. And, and the question is, can we insulate ourselves? And can this transition to local distributed generation and storage, could this be an advantage in this thing? And not just for economic reason, but for security reasons as well. Uh, so what have we done on our grid? People talk about the smart grid, which means a lot of things to a lot of people. What we have done so far is to put our measurement system. To become smart, you need to measure. So we have now put phaser measurement units to measure current voltage, frequency, phase angle um, at, at, as a function of time and location with GPS in about 900 to about 1,000 places on our transmission system. And on the distribution system, right at the end, the customer end of it, uh, we have put some meters in there. That's really what we have done so far. We really have not used the data that is coming out to do anything really transformational or very useful about it. So there's a big data part of it, enabling sort of useful information out of this petascale data that we're getting. Because out of this PMUs, we're getting data at 30 milliseconds. Now, it turns out that in Google, our big query and the big data part of it, the cloud services, are now opening it up and are trying to connect the utility guys and the, and the ISOs to to the Google handling the big data side of it. But there's a real-time market. We do not know how to do real-time control of our electricity. 90% of the electricity that we use today, that we're using today, was planned out yesterday. It's a day-ahead market. There's a one-hour market, there's a 15-minute market, and there's a five-minute market, and there's a real-time market. It's the electricity balancing, which has to be done in real-time, is like a big knob, and there are smaller knobs that we're fine-tuning all the time. So that's how, but why not make the demand response that we have, that we are trying to do for controlling demands and peaks, why can't we have supply response at the same time and have a fully integrated system response? We don't do that today in real time because we don't have real time markets, we don't have the technology. We have the technology, we haven't quite integrated as a system in the right way. One of the elements of that, which we focused in RPE to enable that, is power electronics. And this is a field for the electrical engineers that have been ignored for a while. And people mostly focused on semiconductor electronics in a VLSI, et cetera. But power was ignored. And we focused on that because we realized if you can get the right kind of low cost in a highly functional power electronics, this could be really important for a grid. So what is the problem? The problem is to go to higher frequency of switch mode power electronics for which you need wide band gap semiconductors like silicon carbide and gallium nitride. There are real materials issues out here. Why go to high frequency? It's because if you go to high frequency in any power conversion system, you not only need switches, you need filters. Inductors and capacitors, LC filters, or LCL filters, to be able to go from AC to DC, DC to AC, inverters and, and, and rectifiers, etc. These, the most of the reliability problems happen in capacitors. And most of the cost comes from these inductors and, and capacitors in these large power conversion systems. If you go to high frequency, the inductor size goes down because the impedance remains the same. So for the same impedance of capacitors and inductors, if the frequency goes up, the size goes down. And as a result, the reliability and the cost goes down, or the reliability goes up. 
So this was the motivation, and I'll give you one example of this. This is a substation transformer, about 8,000 pounds, operates at 60 hertz, goes down in voltage. The average age of these transformers in the United States, the ones that were hit in the Metcalf station, is 42 years in the United States. And the expected lifespan is 40 years. So we're living two years on borrowed time right now. In, fi in fact, after the Metcalf, I started reading on what's going on, that stockpiling transformers. So we don't just have a nuclear stockpile. We have a transformer stockpile that is going on right now because we're sort of stuck in that paradigm of, 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 of going up and going down in voltage using essentially uh, the technology that was used during Tesla's time. And we said that perhaps we could do better. And so the heart of the switch mode power conversion of a solid state transformer is, is a transistor, a power transistor. So this one is made of silicon carbide uh, coming out of the company called Cree in North Carolina, which can handle 15 kilovolts of voltage drop across 200 microns of silicon carbide, which is pretty amazing, and it can handle 100 amps. So 1.5 megawatts of electrical power that is switched not at 50 hertz or 60 hertz, but 50 kilohertz. And if that happens, the transformer becomes 100 pounds. It could fit into a suitcase, and you can carry it with you. That's the kind of technology that could happen. And this is not just silicon carbide, gallium nitride, and silicon could also enable a lot of this power conversion that is. And that's the renaissance in power conversion technology that is happening. And we are looking at it very, very closely from Google's side because we use a lot of electricity as well. The big challenge is in magnets. And as you know, if you go to higher and higher frequency, the losses increase, both because the domain walls move around or the eddy current losses. The frequency depends on the losses in these soft magnets, these soft magnets, by the way, and the federal government really has not invested in soft magnets. The frequency depend is still not understood. It's not quite omega squared. It's not quite omega raised to one. It's somewhere in between. And we still don't know how to, how to do that, how, uh, what's going on internally. So there's a lot of research that we funded that needs to be done in trying to understand the science of soft magnets and design it in a way that reduces the losses at high frequency and integrate that in these circuits so that we can do power conversion. And that remains to be done. Let me briefly talk about transportation. Um, as you know, the predominantly we are using gasoline and diesel and internal combustion engine, both the reciprocating and the rotary kind of engines. The question that we have to ask is that, can we, is there other paradigms on this? And as you can see, one of the paradigms is the electrification of that. And this is the, the, um, the cost of lithium-ion batteries coming down and the deployment of EVs. And there's a lot of issues with this, but I'm going to talk about one of them, and that's the battery. So in RPE, we created a program called BEAST to look at things beyond lithium-ion. So if you look at the, the energy density, watt hours per kilogram, you, this is the energy density of lithium-ion um, that, is, that is we have today. And, and the cost is on the order today is about $400 to $500 a usable kilowatt hour in these batteries. So we put a marker at 400 watt hours per kilogram at $250 a kilowatt hour because we realize if you can get to that energy density at that cost, the total cost of an EV will be competitive without subsidies with internal combustion engine cars with a re respectable range that you may have. It's really a range and cost issue. And we said, let's put it out there. Clearly, people have to either you know, boost or have a really sort of turbo lithium-ion battery at its limits, or you have to think beyond lithium-ion. And if you put a marker like that, you, you know, things happen. So this is now the whole range of, of batteries uh, uh, transportation level batteries with high energy density and potentially low cost in the future. Whether it's NVIA, 24M, Pelion, these are still happening. By the way, most of them will fail because we, because there's, you know, some of the technologies may not work. But we hope that at least one of them, a few of them can succeed and that really, the success will depend on understanding, doing the science and engineering and understanding in the right way and scaling it with manufacturing. So that's, that's going on right now. 
Let me end with a brief mention of fuels, of biofuels. And it's really a question of sunlight fuels. Can you convert sunlight and store it in, in, in form of chemical bonds? If you look at all the work that has been done in biofuels, they're based on photosynthesis. And the photosynthetic efficiency of going from sunlight to chemical bonds is less than 1%. And that primarily is due to the inefficiencies that are there in what is called the Calvin-Benson cycle, which essentially takes photons and fixes it using various enzymatic, enzymatic steps. And the efficiency of some of those enzymes, Rubisco, for example, is quite low. And so the carbon flux into chemical bonds is very low. And the energy flux is certainly low. And this is what's going on in whether it is uh, you know, uh, corn-based or ethanol or sugarcane-based, or for that matter, agricultural waste. If you go to algae-based, it's still a photosynthetic. The efficiency may be a little bit higher. But it's still a question of efficiency. And most of the cost that comes is really due to the feedstock, because it's so dilute, you have to collect it, and that raises the cost of the feedstock processing. There's a lot of centers that are going on, whether it's the Energy Bioscience Institute or JBA. Uh, there's ones at Oak Ridge out here, and, um, and the DARPA has funded a lot of the algae-based biofuels, ExxonMobil, NSF, uh, bioenergy research centers that are, are all focused on this. The question is, are there alternative routes? Um, there is the non-photosynthetic route, which is, you know, make syngas and try to make fuels, which a lot of people have try, are trying. Then, of course, there's JCAP, which is Joint Center for uh, Artificial Photosynthesis, one of the energy innovation hubs, which is headquartered in Caltech, but LBL and others are involved in this, in trying to do catalysis, photocatalysis, using inorganic materials to see if you can emulate photosynthesis. That's going on. In RPE, we said that maybe there's another route that has not been tried out, which is biological but non-photosynthetic. And that's the idea of using biological catalysis. And we created, in fact, we created the term, but we also created a sort of initiative called electrofuels. So let me explain what that means. We really broadened the concept of photosynthesis. We said that let's go beyond photons and look for other reducing equivalents whether it's directly on electrons or hydrogen, or hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, oxidation levels of iron. You can go from plus two to plus three and provide a reducing equivalent. And why not just take all reducing equivalents beyond photons? And then we said that, do we really need to use the Calvin-Benson cycle? After all, what are we using biology for? Biology is something that you cannot beat in an artificial system in making specific carbon-carbon bonds. You cannot. The enzymatic process is so good, you're really hard to beat that in terms of efficiency. But Calvin-Benson cycle is not the only one that makes carbon-carbon bonds. There are many others. Reverse tricarboxylic acid cycle, which is the reverse Krebs cycle. Calvin-Benson, Wood, Woods lung down cycle. And we, we challenge the community to come up with your own cycle. Create your own cycle if you want to. And then, of course, this is to fix CO2. And then, of course, to do the metabolic engineering to get to a molecule like um, you know, acetyl-CoA, uh, uh, acetyl if you get to a molecule like that, you can not only get to any fuels, you can get to byproducts. So the idea was to get away from photosynthesis and get away from photosynthetic uh, in a cycle, Calvin-Benson cycle, and try other things. And it turns out there are organisms, extremophiles, deep down in the ocean vents that, can, that survive on non-Calvin-Benson cycle, that survive on oxidation of iron going from plus two to plus three, and they create carbon-carbon bonds. And we said, why don't we take that community, take the metabolic engineering synthetic biology community, and combine them in a workshop? And we said, they came up with the idea. And we said, okay, we'll fund it. And we thought, this is a crazy idea. This is not going to work because we don't even know how to genetically manipulate some of these organisms. And they figured that out. And two years... They created the first, and this I showed in 2011 in the, in the RPE Summit, the first vial of biofuels that was created by the startup company called OPX out of University of Colorado, combined with NC State, the first biofuel without the use of sunlight. And this, they showed the proof of principle. And the next year, in 2012 Summit, I showed a flask, 
and uh, basically was flippant in saying that now you can extrapolate and hopefully in a few years we can get to cost and scale. Of course, that's still the reactor design and the engineering still has to happen. But the point is there are alternative pathways that can happen. And if people says no, it's worth a shot if it doesn't violate the laws of physics. I'm going to end with one more, which is kind of interesting. We also created a program called PETRA. It's a funky acronym. Um, and the problem with biofuels is that the energy density, as I mentioned, is really low. If you look at corn in the United States, it's 80 gigajoules per hectare per year. If you go to sugarcane in Brazil, that number is about 200 gigajoules per hectare per year. And we said, can we get to that with the equivalent of $50 a barrel of oil equivalent, which is a wish list. We said, let's challenge it because we saw that maybe there are opportunities. I'll give you one example that was kind of funky and it's amusing, but it's, it's worth mentioning. The idea is, is to use the metabolic pathway in algae that produces hydrocarbons, long-chain hydrocarbons. But the problem with algae is that the metabolic pathway may be great, but there are all kinds of other issues with algae, whether it's water use, whether it's infections, all kinds of other issues. So this team proposed, why don't we take the metabolic pathway of algae and put that in a plant that grows on really bad soil called tobacco? So the idea would be that if this, if this is done well, done the right way, you could essentially squeeze the leaves of tobacco and get oil out of it. And I said, we've got to do this. Because <laughs> imagine if it is successful. It, you would have big oil and big tobacco <laughs> come together and save the world. And we said that, you know, this may sound amusing, but, you know, it doesn't violate the laws of physics or chemistry. Or, but, but we should give it a shot. Take the risk. And what I now heard just a few weeks ago, it's actually working. This thing is actually producing oil. Of course, it's not at scale yet, but this thing is working. So when people say no, it's always worth trying, understanding whether it is violate the laws of physics or so. Because a lot of naysayers will be there. And yes, if you violate the law, second, first and second law of thermodynamics, then you have a problem, clearly. And I got a bunch of proposals. And in fact, the famous one was, uh, when I look at the first page, is that uh, the laws of thermodynamics are a bit outdated. <laughs> we need to revisit them. Now, if that's, if that's a proposal, you can be rest assured that the rest of it may not be quite valuable. But this did not violate the laws of, of physics. And I think it's very important to look for data or even produce the right kind of data and not look for dogma. So I'm going to end with, uh, I'll skip this slide, um, with some infamous predictions of the past. Uh, this is from Sir William Priest, who's the chief engineer of the British Post. The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys did not quite see the value of Bell Labs that came around later. Um, but, you know, this may be an engineer, but what about a scientist? Uh, here's Lord Kelvin. Radio has no future. X-ray will prove to be a hoax. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Highly opinionated, but wrong. <laughs> but he was not the only one. He managed to convince um, Wilbur Wright who in 1901 said, man will not fly for 50 years. I'm glad he did, did not take himself too seriously, or his brother Orville may have had a bit more influence on him. But clearly this was wrong, but it didn't violate the laws of physics. The best quote I can imagine for what I was talking about in terms of disruptive innovation or using science and engineering is the one from Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think this is the time that we in the scientific community really need to do some magic to address some of the really important problems of our generation and several generations to come. So I want to just say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Arun. Please, please oh, okay. take a seat. Um, so the, the format would be, um, it's relatively open, as you saw with Professor Fiert's lecture. We have questions from the audience. But let me kick it off with a question. Is it safe to presume that you miss the Washington scene? 
watching the illuminations on Fox News and stuff? I really miss Washington because I had a fantastic time. It was the best sabbatical I could have asked for. I mean, when I was leaving, New York Times did an uh, interview with me, and, I, and I, you know, I, I said that what you get in Washington DOE is really the panoramic view of energy because it's not just science and engineering. It's finance. It is markets. The role of policy uh, are how to align technology innovation with finance and markets and how the industry really works and what they value, what's the role of the government uh, and what's the role of the industry, um, that panoramic view is very hard to get in any institution, no matter how good the institution, single institution is. So I really would encourage you. And people say it's, you're giving back to the country. No, you're actually taking, you're learning. And it's more of a learning than giving back that, uh, that, that I at least encountered. So let's, let's pick up on that topic. So you mentioned about, you know, what's the role of government and stuff. Let's talk about what's the role of a government lab, a national lab. Uh, you see evolution, dramatic changes in, in the lab structure that we have? Well, I think the labs are really, in many ways, are the crown jewels of a science and engineering establishment. I mean, this is where science can happen that, are, that industry will never do because their outlook is not what Bell Labs used to be with a 20-30 you know, year outlook. The long-term research in any industry is max seven years because if it does not produce, you know... ROI. Or exactly, in, or revenues in you know, six to seven years or maybe at the most 10 years, it's not worth doing. But you need to have a place where you can do the science and the engineering without the pressure of revenues, of products and revenues coming. Because otherwise, the breakthroughs, the significant breakthroughs that will happen will never come. Not to say we should not work with industry. So I, I think that the opportunity to, to do research, not to say this is blue sky, but really trying to address some of the problems that are outlined, uh, do it in a in the concerted way, but it, without the pressure of producing products and revenues in the next five to seven years is something that needs to be done for the long-term value, long-term health of the, of the nation. And that's where national labs really come in, and frankly universities as well. But universities have other distractions, and, and so do national labs. But I think if that can be carved out in an environment where, where scientists and engineers are allowed to go and push the boundaries, spread their wings into doing things that are bold ideas. That may fail, but have a chance that it can be transformational. I think national labs can really play a role. Of course, we all know the role of facilities, et cetera, that, uh, for example, the spallation neutron source and others. Uh, but that's a magnet to bring people, the, the human capital, the intellectual horsepower, to do things. And I think that's really very, very important. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so a lot of what you're talking about is, is really driven by national policy decisions. Where do we need to be going as a nation? What are the grand challenges? What about Google? Uh, so a lot of what you've been talking about has been what should we do just as a nation? But, but what is the perspective from this one small <laughs> company? What, uh, what is Google there? What, what are you doing at Google? What attracts you there? Most of your interests seem to be national rather than focused in an industry. Can you give the Google perspective? I think that's an excellent question. Um, um, Google, so let me explain this. Google uses a lot of electricity. We care about that. It is a 100% carbon neutral company. 100%. So how do we do that? A is number one efficiency of our use of electricity. Mostly in our data centers strewn across the world, but a lot of them in the United States. Um, so make them as efficient as possible. And I would say Google, and I had, by the way, I had nothing to do with all this. This was all done before I even joined. Um, in terms of reducing the energy consumption, or what they call it PUE, um, which is power utilization effectiveness, um, it's, you know, it used to be about two 
That means you use using as much power for cooling as for processing. Uh, for, and right now it's 1.05, 1.06, um, which is really, really good. And you cannot go less than one, of course. Um, but if you can get to 1.05 or so, it's, you, it's very hard to beat that. So that was number one. Number two, and this is something that our team is involved in, is on the investment side. So if you look at energy as a whole, it's a three-legged stool. One is technology, the second is finance, and the third is markets, whether using price signal or regulatory signal to create markets that will level the playing field. Uh, and the policies are there to align them. So the second thing Google does is finance. So we invest using project finance, not the early stage, but deployment. And Google has invested about $1.4 billion in project finance. And this is not charity. This is to make money for good returns. Most of it is in, in the United States, wind, wind farms or solar farms or transmission lines, high voltage DC transmission corridor in the eastern corridor up there. And this is to make money. And it's all renewable. It's not for coal-fired power plants. It's, that's the decision that was made. We will go carbon neutral and, and promote technologies that are considered risky by Wall Street, but it's financially, if, you know, the, the returns are quite good because it has a power purchase agreement uh, at the right level. So this is a project. And now we have gone overseas. We have just invested in a large solar plant in South Africa, and we are now going to strategically go in certain regions of the world where electricity is not being developed the right way. So that's on the investment side. And finally, what we cannot do is we buy offset, carbon offsets. And we, so we pay. I would also add that even on electricity use, um, as you know, when you have dispatch of electricity into the grid, you go by what is called locational marginal pricing. I mean, I'm getting too technical, but essentially on price. You bid. So I can bid at you know, $500 a megawatt hour. Someone else bids at $400 a megawatt hour. So ISO will go for the $400 first and all that. So what happens then is that it's a purely economic argument. And so we in, um, in North Carolina, working with Duke Energy, Google created something called the green tariff. That means it's a different way of calculating the tariff, which will enable more penetration of solar and wind and other renewables to get in there. So it's a completely different tariff system so that the electricity that we use in our data center comes more for renewable than from other carbon sources. So those are the kinds of things that are going on. Internally, what I'm focused on uh, is more on the technology side, technology innovation. Uh, unfortunately, I can't talk about it, but... The, what I can say is, is really for looking at the paradigm for electricity that I talked about, which is the one-way traffic of centralized generation, transmission system, distribution system. It's a one-way power flow with no information flow. But if you think about it today, solar could be the cheapest way to produce electricity within a decade or a little bit more. Storage is getting cheaper. Power electronics is available. And network distributed computing is now widely available. Tesla and Edison had none of that. So if you were to rethink the grid, what would you do? And that's the question that we're trying to address. Sorry for a long answer. Great answer. Um, Arun, excellent talk. So you covered a long range of uh, energy portfolios, their cost, and given comparisons. I would like to know your uh, perspective of how this globalization affects these kind of technologies. I'm and sorry, global what? Yeah, the globalization. Now we are in a much globalized world, and we see solar technology evolving in other parts of the country, and we saw the applied materials things in, happening in, in terms of China's and Germany's. And how this, what is your perspective on how it affects the cost and U.S. competitiveness, uh, so on and so <coughs> forth? I think that's something useful. So this is a great question because the solar industry gave us a good view of what could happen in a global way. Um, the markets in Germany and Spain changed. Uh, there was a glut um, in the solar panels. Uh, China reduced the you know, cost of capital. The, the panel cost came down. U.S. manufacturers uh, went out of business, basically. 
uh, but the U.S. deployment went up. And this is a great example of a global market um, and a global ecosystem of supply chain um, that has to, you know, that exists. And all of these technologies, they will exist. So except for a few things. I mean, if you are building large windmills, it's very hard to transport them from China. You will have to build them out here. So one really has to strategically view this as to what is the strength of a nation uh, in terms of manufacturing. What do we really want to get out of this? A lot of people say we need manufacturing. Yes, we do. But there are other benefits of manufacturing that are not often quoted in that. So, um, so we have to really strategically think as to what we want to get out of this. Right now, I'm in a National Academy committee called Making Value. And this was created by the former President E. Chuck West, who just recently died. But before he died, he said that, go, let's go get a report. Let's look at this analysis of what is making value, manufacturing being part of it, and how do we strategize in the future in terms of the supply chain? Which part of the supply chain? Because when you look at the development of any technology, the rate-limiting step, which is where the value, you know, in terms of returns and margins are, keeps moving around. Okay? It's not fixed at a certain place. Um, Dell computers were great. You know, they made a lot of money. But they are no longer the rate-limiting step. is making PCs. It may be the chip. So the value supply chain, the, the, the value changes. And the question is, how do we create that value in the United States? And that you know, requires, of course, human capital, education level. that has financial capital, access to that, ecosystem, competition, collaboration, all of those things. And I, so I don't have a straight answer uh, to you, but I think this is something we definitely need to think very strategically for the next several decades, given where we are seeing the industry is going, the demographics are going, what do we do in the United States? So, so let me follow up with this a little bit. Um, I want to tie um, his question back to the ARPA-E premise. And perhaps you should, you should um, uh, tell the audience the, the fundamental premise for the creation of ARPA-E, but then also say, you talked about all of these different programs, you know, innovation, competition, and stuff. How did we answer the issue of how do we make it here? Great question. So um, I think this is uh, something that you, <laughs> you struggle with that a lot. You know, this is a, not a simple answer because, A, if you do not make anything, <laughs> we lose our competitive end in research, frankly. It, it affects because this is not, it, it's not a demarcation between research, R&D, and, and manufacturing. If something happens to a chip in Intel, you know, in a manufacturing process, what do they do? They go back, look under a microscope. They figure out what the failure mechanisms are, then try to correct the manufacturing process. So research, R&D, and manufacturing are integrally related. I mean, I'm, by the way, if you haven't read the book, uh, it's worth reading. I'm just, you know, like at about 120 pages right now into the book called um, the, Idea the Idea Factory about Bell Labs. It's the Bell Lab story. It's the Bell Lab story. And I think it's, what is fascinating is that they had manufacturing of vacuum tubes way back in the 30s and 40s and the research community all integrated together. And it was not enough to just invent the vacuum tube, which they did, to make repeaters. Um, for, for telephone conversations to go across the continent. But they had to manufacture. In the manufacturing process, they realized how difficult it is to do it over and over again. And that helped in the research and finally said that this is going, this is, this is not the technology we want to run for the next 20 years. Maybe there's a solid state approach to this, which is what gave rise to the transistor. And in fact, this was a conversation from the people from the manufacturing side that this is really hard, vacuum tubes. And you've got to be, have a better way. So I think the integration of manufacturing and productization into the research community is extremely, extremely important. And at least for that reason, forget about the jobs and the revenue and the income, you know, the taxes that would come out, that is all good. But at least for the research, which is a bread and butter 
and we have the best research infrastructure in the United States, at least for that, it's very, very important to have some manufacturing out here. Yeah. So I, I always use this, this analogy that in the, in the Lion King movie, if by some chance you killed Simba halfway through, some, some cartoonist did that, right? Entire Disney premise is gone. They, they lose all people like me who saw the movie 20 times over with my kids. That's gone. So manufacturing is part of this, this continuous chain of, of things. So, so if you're Simba, am I scar? Is that <laughs> <laughs> We may all be scarred for life, but, <laughs> but, but what did RPE do? To continue that, because you're still early on in the innovation cycle. So, it, it, the, so the role of RPE is Perhaps to. Perhaps you should also say something about the genesis of RPE. Some of our colleagues here may not know. Okay. Yeah. And Tennessee so, was very central to that. Absolutely. So, it goes back to Congress, where two senators and two members of the House. Uh, the two senators were Jeff Bingaman and Lamar Alexander from Tennessee. And two members of the House, um, uh, Sherry Bowler on the Republican side and Bart Gordon from, the, from Tennessee, um, asked and wrote a letter to the National Academies that led to the committee called the Rising of the Gathering Storm. That was led by Norm Augustine. Steve Chu was a member of that committee. So were Craig Barrett, who's going to come and speak. And you can ask him as to you know, what the origins were inside story was. Chuck West was part of that. Uh, George Whitesides, et cetera. And they made several recommendations. In fact, it's a beautiful report if you ever had a chance to look at it because it goes to what a report should be, recommendations, very specific recommendations as to what should be done, what should Congress do. One of those recommendations was to create uh, a DARPA-like organization for energy because the business as usual, they found some gathering storms for that and you needed some quantum leaps in technology, some new breakthroughs in technology um, that could translate science and create these, these learning curves. They didn't call learning curves, but that's basically what they meant. And at that time, there, there was a lot of concern. Well, DARPA has a customer. <laughs> that is the Department of Defense. What's going to be RPE's customer? And I heard that from day one. Who's your customer? And I said, wow, this is research. You know, anyone who uses energy is a customer. But, of course, the, is the, even in DARPA's case, it goes to the industry. The industry actually is the customer in this case, in, in their, their case as well. Nevertheless, that's the origin. And I must say that Tennessee played a huge role and continued to play while I was in Washington, um, the members of the House and Senate who actually helped out in really you know, getting RPE to a place where it was stable in many, many different ways. And so that's, that's sort of the origins of RPE. But it was really to innovate breakthrough technologies. It was not for manufacturing. But in our case, the way we looked at it is that if you are coming up with a catalyst that is based on osmium or ruthenium, it's hard to imagine that could be manufactured at scale and at cost. You might as well try iron. And so we paid a lot of attention to what could be scaled in the future. So if you're coming up with an idea that we know it's not going to scale, then you might as well not go after it. But there are ideas that you don't know whether it's going to scale, but it, there's a chance it'll scale. You'll take a shot at that. And for some of you who may have gotten an RPA project, there's a pretty intense process in trying to find out what is, if it at scale, what's a, how much would it cost? So cost and scale is very important we were at the early stages, but we paid some attention to it to make sure that the things that we were funding we had a shot at scalability, but would not shut down. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Dr. Goyal. So, so just continuing the discussion, you, know, you, you mentioned uh, that ARPA-E was distinguished um, by, by concentrating on transformational learning curves compared to, you know, the, the, the regular economic learning curves, you scale volume, you decrease cost. I mean, you could argue, uh, one could argue that anything that DOE sponsors should be really geared towards transformational learning curves predominantly because the, the regular learning curves should really be the domain of, um, you know, the companies um, 
because they, are, they have to worry about volume, revenue. So um, do you think that model should extend beyond um, just ARPA-E, maybe to me, really the rest of the applied programs? No, I mean, I go ahead. So, no, no, he and I have had this argument in our apartment several times. Yeah. So please, please go ahead. Um, I was car in that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very, so let's put that in a whole system context. And let's look at the role of the government versus the role of industry. And you've got to realize where industry is today and how much of a time horizon it has. As I said, if something does not produce revenue in five to seven years, industry will not do. That's just the very nature of you know, public companies and, frankly, even private companies. So given that, given that scenario, and you ask the question, how long does a technology take to mature to produce revenues in, in five to seven years? The answer is anywhere from five to ten years. Okay, so if that's the case, and you know, or some, in fact, many cases, it is 20 years, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years, right? So you got to be able to provide not just the technology breakthrough from the government side, but to nurture it to the point that the industry can take over, and in five, ten, seven years, they can make revenue out of it. So there's a gap out there, and there are multiple valleys of death, by the way. That requires the government to fill in because otherwise we'll never get make any progress in the industry. And so you can look at the history of even fracking. And that goes back to the early 80s when DOE supported and people like Mitchell and all will acknowledge the support of the government. Others may not, but he went through that. And the government kept on supporting to the point it becomes a commercial, commercially viable venture and then the industry takes over and uses it. So I think that's where the role of the applied programs are, is to really enable that transition from a breakthrough that has happened to the point that the industry can take over and, and start scaling. And you take the case of, let's say, the lithium-ion battery. To make the lithium-ion battery cost-effective and safer with earth abundant materials, you need research. So the applied programs have to do science and engineering to be able to help the industry move along. Steve. What's your perspective on the future of nuclear energy nationally and globally? Well, you all probably know this better than I do out here in Oak Ridge. But frankly, what is going on right now, as, as you all well know, is this transition to something called SMR, uh, small modular reactors. Um, and the primary reason for that is financial. And I was sort of involved in that when the FOA came out, SMR. It went through the Undersecretary's office. And I hope, I really hope, and this is something that I was insisting on internally, is not just to reduce, go to the SMR to reduce the financial risk, which is the capital exposure that you would have for big reactors, but also to use this opportunity to reduce the levelized cost of electricity production. Because a lot of it goes into construction cost. And if you modularize it, you have a shot at reducing construction costs, reducing the cost of levelized cost of electricity. Because that, that, at the end of the day, it has to be competitive without subsidies. And um, I really hope that DOE pushes that, pushes the industry towards that. It's not that the industry is not un unaware but I think you need a little bit of pressure to get towards those things and become competitive. So that's what I think. But if the technology is still light water reactor. The technology is nothing new. It just takes time for NRC for approval, et cetera. And I think in parallel to that, there has to be an effort for the non-conventional nuclear, whether you call it Gen 3, Gen 4, or perhaps others. And, you know, I think... We don't do enough of that, uh, frankly, in, in nuclear energy to try out other approaches. There was a lot of discussion internal into RPE, whether we look at other things um, and, in, involved in nuclear. 
And uh, we did not at the time, because I don't think our budgets allowed us to do that. But there was, you know, I don't know how many debates that we had whether we should go nuclear or not. Um, but I think they should. I think RPE combined with, we had, I had many discussions with Pete Lyons and Pete Miller before that on where we could help the nuclear industry um, and, and materials or other ways of converting instead of through heat, direct conversion of high energy particles directly to electricity. And if you do it efficiently, cost effectively, maybe that's the way to go. There are a lot, a lot of debates on this and discussions. So I, I think there's a lot of room out there. Uh, I hope Office of Nuclear Energy spends a little bit of money on trans- so the other things. Um, and RP does that too. I have a question related to the, how the role of government works. Uh, we, you know, a lot of things you were discussing is how uh, uh, ARPA E and I can, can get th- th- things involved. And I think, I'm not sure, I, I guess they weren't talking about funding these, but trying to get them going. But uh, we know that in a lot of cases, <clears throat> uh, industry can't go out and develop new technologies because they, they spend the money and somebody else reaps the benefits, and so they won't do this. Um, and, uh, and also we know that uh, the last administration, you got in trouble with funding companies to do things big time, and they sometimes fail because they weren't. Um, but then there's the other issue, a thing which I think I got out of Tom Friedman's book about the unpleasant, crowded world, uh, where like in, the, in 75 to 95 or something, the government had said, look, we're going to have to increase uh, refrigeration, uh, uh, to increase the efficiency of refrigeration, air conditioning, and and then cooling, uh, and that if I remember it right, it was like uh, it increased by the efficiency by a factor of four between 75 and, and 95 because they all knew that it was going to be a requirement, mm-hmm. uh, and then they all could work on it. And then, of course, with gasoline uh, on cars, they stopped that and didn't happen there. But the question is, how uh, you know what is the role of government to, to do it? I mean, in one way, if, the, if there's an insured requirement, they all can do it and do it privately, uh, as opposed to trying to fund or, or, to, or to even fund rational labs yeah. to do some of these things. So this is really the question of what's the role of the government in creating regulatory policy? Okay. Applying standards, I think that's what you're referring to uh, being one of them. Um, and just the story of applying standards uh, on the refrigerator case is the fact that in 1970s, the first refrigerator standard came out. It came out actually from California. Then the federal government adopted it. The, the performance, the efficiency or COP of refrigerators are a factor of three or four or five higher. The size has increased of refrigerators and is limited by the size of your door in your home. Other than that, it would have increased even more. And interesting enough, even the equivalent price of refrigerators has come down significantly. Now, you ask, you know, a lot of people say if you put regulatory standards like that, the price will go up, and it does not. And the question is why. There are a lot of economic theories based uh, for this, to explain this. But it, essentially what it happens is that when you put the right kind of regulatory pressure, not the wrong kind, I can explain what the wrong kind is, but the right kind of regulatory pressure that someone demonstrates that it is possible and you make that a standard or close to it that a standard, to meet that standard, people have to innovate. And when innovation happens, there's a competition that is created because everyone's trying to meet the standard and, and they have to innovate in the competition amongst the companies that are trying to do that. And because of the competition, the price comes down. And I think that's an effect that should not be underestimated. And, uh, you know, that happened in not just refrigerator, many other appliances as well. Um, there could be a wrong kind of regulatory pressure, but if you do it the right way, it really helps out. And so the question is, are there other opportunities? If you have, which is difficult to foresee right now, but a lot of people now starting to talk about it, influential people, if you have the right kind of carbon price, what would happen? It would level the playing field. In fact, someone I work with, George Schultz, who had the Hoover, 
He has been calling for carbon tax, but revenue neutral. So put a tax on carbon, collect the money, give it back to the people so that it doesn't go back into the government pool of taxes, and then it could be wasted. Give it back to the people because the people might get affected by the rise in price of energy because of carbon tax. Well, give it back to the people. But it levels the playing field and gives the signal to the business community to transition. I really hope at some point we get to that situation because it, it is a way to level the playing field and put some regulatory pressure on the market side. So I think those are the kinds of things that have worked. By the way, the, 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 the carbon tax, the revenue neutral carbon tax, is working in, in British Columbia. British Columbia, you may think, is a small one, but it's a, it's a microcosm that it, where it actually has worked. And so that, that's what we're looking at right now. And if it's coming from people like George Schultz, people are paying attention to that right now. Yeah, before your mic reaches, it'll take a few days maybe. You know, but uh, but uh, so what's, what do you think education can do? Uh, what about bringing huge amounts of energy, environment, education into the schools and stuff? What do you think about it? Ah, uh, <laughs> very interesting. I, I, was, I was asked to visit a high school in Chicago and give a talk. And that was the scariest thing I could have ever done, because I didn't know what to expect. I was fascinated by the interest kids have, at least in this particular, I have one data point, um, of how much interest they had and, and energy, because after all, I explained to them, this is their future. Yeah. This is the world that they're entering right now, they have to deal with. Yeah. Um, I really think it's very important on multiple levels. Frankly, I'm not sure we have done a good enough job to explain to society what global warming is all about. And there are all kinds of misrepresentations of this. And frankly, over-representation sometimes of what the consequences are of this. Yeah. And I think this is an important, I think it's incumbent upon scientists and engineers to really explain this in rational, logical terms, and I think the education part, not just at this high school and school level, which I think is a little bit easier, but have them educate their parents uh, about what the implications are. And I think this is critically important. Mm, yeah. So education at multiple levels. The other thing that I, I really feel important that to really change and transition the economy, it is not just science and engineering. We really, have to, we really have to pay attention to the other aspects, the social. The, the social aspects to this. The humanities are critically important. Yeah. And, I, and uh, you know, science and engineering, we are in that ecosystem. We forget the other side of it. And we really need to understand the humanity side of it. Because at the end of the day, it's all about people. Yeah. And that education needs to start in the high school and middle yeah. school as well. Yeah. Well said, well said. So, who was your hero as you were growing up? You. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. I'm not that much older than you are. <laughs> so, let's first debunk that particular... Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> back to that question. <laughs> who did you idolize? I'll be honest. When I was growing up, my hero were people who were playing cricket. That's true. That's okay? true. <laughs> I was deep. I mean, for those of you who are not from that part of the world, this, you know, in India, where I was growing up, you know, it's, it's like the United States. It's freedom of religion. There's one religion that I know of <laughs> that unites the whole country, and that's cricket. cricket. <laughs> so my heroes were people who were just top-notch, you know, cricketers. I mean, frankly, I, that's... I'm being brutally honest about it. It's not the scientific world. It's not, you know, people say, oh, your hero must have been Gandhi. Yeah, fine. But the guys who were hitting the ball so hard, that's my hero. I was a kid. So, so. Th That's true, though. I mean, in 2011, when we were sharing an apartment, um, the, the World Cup was going on in India. So he would wake me up at 2.45 in the morning, you know, 
There was another crazy Indian guy who was an RPE program manager. The three of us will stay up till eight o'clock, you know, watch the game, then brush teeth and go to work. And, and despite the appropriation hearing the next morning, the next morning, <laughs> that's right? Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty hard religion, you know. <laughs> Um, so did you have any culture question. shock going from DOE to Google? West Coast, East Coast? Well, the culture shock was the food was free, <laughs> and it continues to be free. Um, Google environment, actually, frankly, it's, it's um, just to I mean, I don't know if you – I haven't actually seen the movie Internship, but some people tell me that it, it gives an insight of Google. Yes, the food is free. You get – level two charging anytime and all kinds of really nice things. It's an intense place. It's about hardcore engineering. It's a technology-driven place. Leadership in, in Google, almost all the senior leadership in Larry Page's team have engineering backgrounds. And it's the engineer's paradise. And so, and people are trying to use the engineering to really change the way people use information. The user experience, I never appreciated how much the value of that. The user experience is so, so important, connecting with people. And then I asked my computer science friends that this is the user experience Larry's been talking about. Is this a trivial problem in computer science? Is it really hard? He said, no, no, this is the problem. To, the engineer's job is to provide the solution to, provide that, to give that user experience. And that is so much of value. And so the engineer's job is to figure out how to do it. But the, the challenge is posed right from the top. He said, this is what we want to be. This is what we want to do. And it's an extremely intense place. It's almost like a university. You can collaborate. So I formed my own RPE team, like RPE-like team inside Google. I went around, you know, convincing people, hey, come and work for this because this is a really cool project. They said, yeah. I'll do that. Some people said no. Some people said yeah. So you form a team and you go after a problem. It, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's a little bit by, like Bell Labs, but that's sort of what the environment is. It's very not interesting. dramatically different working for Steve Chu. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's very similar yeah. in many ways. Yeah. yeah. So we'll take one, maybe two last questions. Um, yeah. I, I the mic is still the mic on its way. Uh, you, had a quote, you had a quote in your talk about uh, how Britain had good messenger boys, they didn't need telephones. So is the country in a similar position now because we have such a very good uh, electrical grid, uh, um, energy, um, petroleum distribution network, everything is good to where um, any new technology has a hard chance making it here, but maybe it's more successful in another part of the world where such good messenger boys, the such good network is not already in place. And how do we, in, if that were true, how do we still go about um, developing the technology with a national science investment? Great question. I mean, so if you think about globally, there are one and a half, there are seven billion people in the world. There are one and a half billion people who have zero access to electricity. The grid does not even reach. There's another one and a half billion people where the wires are there, but there's no power flow. The electrons are moving around, but the, the power is not being transmitted. So that three billion people, almost half the world's population, really do not have access to electricity that we have today out here. So the question you may ask is, do you really want to extrapolate the Tesla Edison grid for them? Or do you want to create a new architecture, new infrastructure, that based on 21st century realities? and to enable them to leapfrog over what, very similar to what they did for telephone lines and cell phones. And I think that's the opportunity. And now it is, even five years ago, it was not affordable. But now with solar and coming down and storage coming down, in the next 10 to 15 years, that would be the cheapest. In fact, in many parts of the world where diesel is used for electricity generation, solar plus storage, solar alone is way cheaper than diesel. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the opportunity in terms of energy that we got to think global. We cannot think the United States because most of the growth is going to happen globally. 99% of the population growth that's going to happen in the next 40 years, 99% is going to be in the regions 
where they do not have electricity today or have access to energy, we have it out here. That's where the people are going to be. And this is, I feel, frankly, is the business opportunity of a lifetime yeah. to, to create the right kind of technology, manufacturing out here, and sell it over there. Enable the rest of the world to come up to our lifestyle so that they can use Google and information and all that. That's the, that's the you know, if you, which is sort of like what happened after the war. Marshall Plan. We enabled other parts of the world to incre improve the economy, to have economic growth, because it actually helped us. It had other implications as well, but it helped us. So we need that kind of thinking to enable the rest of the world to raise their quality of life, or human development index, which is highly correlated with electricity use at the early stages. And thereby, you know, we can then trade with them. We can do business in a way that we cannot do today. So we haven't forgotten you guys. There's a, a question from up there. Yes, uh, concerning nuclear energy, um, how is ERPA, or I'm sorry, ERPA-E supporting the lithium fluoride thorium reactor, or is that not on the table? I don't think ERPA-E, at least in my time, we were supporting lithium fluoride thorium reactors. I don't think so. Um, they may be supporting it now, um, but thorium has a long history here in Oak Ridge. Uh, thorium reactors. Um, I certainly hope, and this is one of the alternative technologies, I certainly hope that there is some element of effort looked at thorium for a variety of reasons. I know Canada is looking at it very closely, so is India. But I don't, I'm not sure whether there's an effort in the United States, at least I'm not aware of, but we are certainly not looking at it um, at RPE. Or RPE was not supporting. We had discussed it, but we were not supporting it at that time. So Arun will be here today and uh, tomorrow morning, and so you will have enough chance. There will be a big poster session. You guys should go. There will be about 100 posters, all the young scholars and stuff. So I would like to request Tom to formally present the, the lectureship. Thank you very much, Arun. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ramesh, and thank you, Arun. I'd like to offer you... A memento of this second Eugene Wigner lecture series. Uh, the previous memento we had was, was much heavier, so this one's a little easier to transport by plane. Uh, although we will ship it to you if you prefer. But thank you very much. So... Uh, Thank you also to the organizers and, and all of you for attending. And uh, as you heard, there's going to be an afternoon poster session on Main Street down at the main campus between 5 and 6.30. And the Wigner Lecture Series will continue on the 12th of February, uh, 2014, with Nobel Laureate and former Energy Secretary Steve Chu. So thank you all. Have a great day.